All of us go through good and bad days in life, the dark ones and the ones filled with light. From some of these dark days, we recover quickly, and at other times, it takes us a lifetime. The goal still is to move from darkness to light. And the wisdom of Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, is what we will use today as part two, where we'll go through tactics of how to use the principles that we did in the previous episode to move from darkness into light. So join me on this journey of ancient wisdom and science. The dark days of life create wounds in us that Bessel van der Kolk wrote in this wonderful book called The Body Keeps the Score. And these wounds live at our DNA level, at our cellular level. And what is really amazing about Sun Tzu's work is that 2,500 years ago, he recognized that far before the science could actually prove that the wounds of battle can live at the cellular level. Recognizing that, he created these tactics to fight the battles to win, and that was his entire purpose. So we'll start with the first tactic. And the first tactic is direct and indirect methods of defeating the enemy. We're gonna call it the line of direct and indirect attack. That is the first tactic. So like we did in the principles, I'm going to read a paragraph from The Art of War, and then we'll go through the interpretation of what that really means from the perspective of attacking our inner demons to win this battle, one battle at a time so we can win the war. So let me pull the book out and we'll read a paragraph to address what Sun Tzu had to say about direct and indirect attacks. In all fighting, the direct method may be used for joining battle, but indirect methods will be needed in order to ensure victory. Indirect tactics, efficiently applied, are inexhaustible as heaven and earth, unending as the flow of rivers and streams, like the sun and moon. They end their course but to begin anew, like the four seasons. They pass to return once more. There are not more than five musical notes, probably meaning only five employed in Chinese music of the era. Yet, the combinations of these five give rise to more melodies than probably can ever be heard. There are not more than three primary colors, yet in combination they produce more hues than can ever be seen. There are not more than five tastes, sour, acrid, salt, sweet, bitter, yet combinations of them yield more flavors than can ever be tasted. In battle, there are not more than two methods of attack, the direct and indirect. Yet these two in combination give rise to an endless series of maneuvers. The direct and indirect lead onto each other in turn. It's like moving in a circle. You never come to an end. Who can exhaust the possibilities of their combination? So this is where the practicality of how we use Sun Tzu's principles comes to work. This is what we would say where the rubber meets the road. The examples of direct line of attack in science and psychology would be things like going to a psychiatrist and getting prescribed some medications, going to a therapist and going through talk therapy, whether it be cognitive behavioral therapy or other modalities. If the demons are deep inside that create things like addictions and deep fears, rehab may be a direct strategy. And finally, there's psychosomatic techniques like neurofeedback, tapping, EMDR, the eye movement desensitization and randomization. All of those are direct methods to attack the inner demons. Then there are the indirect methods like mindfulness, meditation, 
sitting down and doing some self-compassion work, including self-compassion meditations, writing a gratitude journal, the three blessings exercise that we all know about. If you don't know about it, you can read about it. Just Google three blessings exercise slash gratitude or, or gratitude journaling and you'll come up with it. Now, the, the best part about this is that you don't have to be exclusive to either direct or indirect methods. In fact, what we do know is that a combination of direct and indirect methods yields the best results, just like what Sun Tzu talks about. The combinations of these strategies can create incredible number of maneuvers to attack your inner demons. Let me give you an example. Let's say that you have issues with anxiety and fear and panic attacks. Well, in terms of panic attacks, you might in fact need help from things like neurofeedback, talk therapy, and maybe even medications. For things like anxiety, we know that self-compassion and mindfulness meditation reduces the impact of anxiety. Now, medications on top of that may also be necessary. Similarly, any thing related to stress or confidence can be addressed in a variety of combinations of these direct and indirect lines of attack. The prerequisite of making these combinations effective is for you to really understand what are the conditions that you're dealing with. We touch these in the principles under preparedness to really understand what you're feeling. Where are you feeling it? How is your body processing it? What is your, your scaffolding and structure of support around you? What's your family look like? Do you have a job? Do you not have a job? What is your level of stress? Really evaluating the lay of the land like a general, do, general would do to make sure that the combinations of direct and indirect attacks are suitable for the conditions that are at play. That is tactic number one. Tactic number two deals with the outside demons. What I mean by that is the outer demons that create your inner demons. Specifically, people around you who pull you down, people who destroy your confidence, people who bully you, who tell you you're not good enough, who create these negative self-talk inside you, so you go into these dark corners. You know, we have talked about one really amazing concept in, in Buddhism called mudita, which means sympathetic joy. It's actually a very rare thing to have sympathetic joy, meaning being happy in the happiness of someone else. So tactic number two is to destroy these outer demons. And that tactic is to conceal and to deceive. So you're not trying to conceal and deceive as in being deceptive from a character perspective, but this is a technique in war that Sun Tzu talked about. So the enemy, in this case your outer enemy, would not know what you're up to. And there are three parts to this deception and concealment process. The first is simulate disorder. Sun Tzu talks about this. That when you simulate disorder, it would mean to the person who is observing you that you're still living in that dark place. But inside you know that you have discipline, that it's not disorder. The second is to simulate fear. And the observers would think that you are fearful still, that you don't have the confidence, but inside you have the courage. The third is to simulate weakness. And that would allow those who are outside that are creating these demons for you to think they don't need to do any more work, you're still weak, but inside you are strong. That deception and concealment of what you are working on is a technique that people on 
battlefields use, that generals on the battlefields use to confuse the enemy. The enemy doesn't get to understand what's going on and by the time they find out what's going on, it's too late. You would have been well on your way to destroying some of these inner demons that were caused by the outer demons. That is tactic number two. That leads us to tactic number three. Tactic number three is momentum. In war, momentum is incredibly essential. In management, Jim Collins has actually talked about momentum. So let's take his analogy first. Jim Collins in his book called Good to Great talks about the flywheel concept. The flywheel is, you know, that wheel you have to keep pushing. Like if you're, you're chopping fodder in a farm, that's that flywheel that you have to keep turning. And it takes a lot of effort to get it going because it's incredibly heavy, made out of this heavy metal. But once you get it going, it develops a momentum and all you need to do is maintain the momentum with little effort. But one other thing that's important in this, in this effort is that Jim Collins talks about is that there is no silver bullet, no one single strategy, no one miracle that will actually help you develop the momentum. It's a combination of different things that you do. The combination of direct and indirect methods like we talked about in tactic number one. And once you have that momentum going, then you will find that the ease with which you can destroy each one of these inner demons becomes far improved over time because you have momentum behind you. Let me read what Sun Tzu has to say about momentum in his book. The clever combatant looks to the effect of combined energy and does not require too much from individuals. Hence his ability to pick out the right men and to utilize combined energy. When he utilizes combined energy, his fighting men become as it were like unto rolling logs or stones. For it is the nature of a log or stone to remain motionless on level ground and to move when on a slope if four-cornered, to come to a standstill, but if round-shaped, to go rolling down. Thus, the energy developed by good fighting men is as the momentum of a round stone rolled down a mountain thousands of feet in height. That lesson of fighting men, when adapted to the science of psychology and ancient wisdom to defeat the inner demons, are the various modalities you can use. Your fighting men are all the tools, the arsenals that you have in your quiver, the arrows you have in your quiver to actually defeat this enemy. And once that momentum develops, once you have the preparedness to get going, and then you have a discipline to keep moving and moving in a strategic manner. Now, a lot of these tactics are connected to the principles. So I would urge you to watch the part one of the video because it'll, all of this will make a lot more sense when you've combined the principles with the tactics. For example, discipline is a very important part of building momentum and discipline is part of one of the principles we talked about in great detail. And that is how the thread runs through the entire 13 chapters of this book that you cannot use any one tactic, any one principle in isolation. They're all connected. So it's a complete work of, you know, I guess the example is when you go for a workout uh, at the gym and if you're used to a certain routine, you feel incomplete if you don't go through all of the steps. I do yoga every morning and I follow the same steps every day and then I do some pranayam, some breathing exercises and then I do my meditation and then I go for my 5K walk. Well, that's the routine I must follow. And if I'm disciplined about it, then all of the ailments, like my allergies or some of the anxieties that I've harbored for many, for, for many years, they all start to come to an end. That momentum comes from discipline. And the discipline comes from being aware of the conditions that are around you and finding 
what is the lowest hanging fruit you can attack first and from that build the momentum to go to more difficult tasks. That leads us to tactic number four. Tactic number four is flexibility. It's perhaps one of the most important tactics. Now why is that? Because it gives you the adaptability to pull in all of your personal strengths and all of the tools and the arsenals to attack all different kinds of the demons that, that bring us down. I'm going to give you some examples on that. So, the most effective way to be flexible in this battle is to first identify your personal strengths and then use the strengths to address which parts of your arsenal are going to be most effective in addressing whatever is ailing you. So let's go through what some of these strengths may look like. In some of the episodes, you've heard me mention this personality or character strength survey at viacharacter.org. When you identify your signature strengths, which are the top five or six strengths, then that's the best of you. Let me give you my personal example to make this point clear. So my top five strengths go as follows. Number one is creativity. Number two, spirituality. Number three, perspective. Number four, appreciation of art and excellence, which is nature. Number five, kindness. Number six, gratitude. So if now I know what are my top five signature strengths, what is the best of me that gets me really excited and motivated, how can I then use these strengths to address some of my demons? If creativity is my top strength and something is troubling me, then art and music and expression of creativity can bring the peace inside that I need and the calm that I need to address whatever that demon might be. If spirituality is number two, then if anxiety bothers me, then meditation and mindfulness and connecting with something bigger than myself would bring down that level of anxiety. It always does. If perspective is my strength number three and I am troubled by some stress or if I have some self-confidence issues like I didn't fit in as I mentioned in some episodes, then journaling and pers creating perspective of what you are seeing and what it really is or what it should be can help you shift the way you look at things. Art and appreciation of excellence is nature. So when I get troubled by this seasonal affective disorder that comes every summer because my father committed suicide in the summer, then I try to find time to go to the beach every morning and every evening. Sunsets are incredibly soothing for me. Anything in nature brings me peace. We now have evidence from the Japanese concept of forest bathing of how it actually reduces cortisol and stress hormones in your body. This is amazing science about your signature strengths that actually help defeat the weaknesses. So once you become aware, and awareness was one of the first principles we talked about in the first episode, and once you become aware of these strengths, then you can effectively address each one of these demons. The last in my signature strengths is kindness. Kindness can be expressed in a variety of ways. My entire mission in life now is driven by that signature strength. Now the others play a role in it too. But if you also have kindness as one of your strengths, then perhaps working in a charity, volunteering your time in a soup kitchen, helping the homeless, whatever it is that you feel expresses kindness or enhances kindness in you, that could help you also reduce the level of anxiety, become connected with the present moment, empathy can rise inside you, which we know creates 
all kinds of reduction in stress hormones. It activates your parasympathetic nervous system. That's where the science comes in. And for me, my kindness, uh, the signature strength is expressed in the work I do with orphans, abused children, trafficked people, uh, people who have gone through some, some terrible times like those who've been refugeed, separated from their parents. Any of that that brings out the empathic nature which is really inert in all of, the, all of our human beings. It's part of our existence. It sits there as, as an inert um, strength. But to make it more visible, you can exercise that kindness. So flexibility allows you to take that direct and indirect fields of attack, which was tactic number one, combine it with your signature strengths, and then use all of this combination of arsenal to attack your inner demons. And the best way we can help you with kindness is with this invitation. Karuna is all about removing suffering from this world. Karuna means the compassionate desire to remove suffering. We have five ways you can express this kindness. When you visit our website, accesscarona.com and subscribe to it, you will find that you can volunteer with us, you can be our partner, you can be an ambassador and contribute content, you can be a sponsor, you can be an attendee in some of the journeys that we are planning. And that will allow you to build these arsenal further because the entire goal of Karuna as a mission is to make this world a happier place by unleashing compassion. So join us on this journey. Let us work together to defeat all of our inner demons, the ones that I have, the ones that you have, the ones your friends have and your family have. Let's work together. Please help us. Join us.